exception of SCAD Hong Kong, as well as other places. Kevin Sip is, has expertise in printmaking, painting, sculpture, and multimedia installation. He is also a poet, which I've learned today. Um, he is currently the public art coordinator for Gallery 72 in Atlanta, which is part of the Mayor's Office of Cultural Affairs for the City of Atlanta. And he has a BA in printmaking from the Atlanta College of Art. Kevin Cole has a Bachelor of Science in Art Education, a Master's um, in Art Education and Painting, and um, a Master's of Fine Arts from Northern Illinois University. Uh, he is a college board consultant and teaches how to teach AP Art at SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design. He painted, I'm sure many of y'all have seen it, the very large uh, mural, um, Coca-Cola sponsored mural for the 1996 Olympics in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. So it's on the side mm -hmm. of the building. Uh, Alfred Conte has a Bachelor of Fine Arts from Hampton University and a Master's of Fine Arts from the Georgia Southern University. And he has works held by NBA player Daryl Walker. And the Sultan Suad al Qasemi from Dubai. Is that how I pronounce it? Yes. <laughs> Linnemeyer has deep roots in Madison, and I'm sure you all have seen her before and seen her works um, through the Cultural Center as well as the African American Museum. She's an award-winning photo-based mixed-media artist, and she has works held in the High Museum of Art, the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, Jackson Hartsfield Airport, as well as other places. And uh, we have more on your bios if you are interested. We have a book over at the entrance to the exhibit, and we welcome, uh, invite you to read it out there. Uh, this exhibit was curated by Judy Barber, guest curator, and Judy is no stranger to the Stephen Thomas Museum or Madison. She's a past director of the Cultural Center, past director of Hambig Center, and an artist herself. She's had a single woman show at the High Museum, and we are just very, very honored to have had her curate the Lucinda Bunham exhibit that we previously held, as well as this one. So I'm going to turn it over to Judy as the moderator. And Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to just say a few words about how the show came about for me. Uh, of course, I was invited by the Stephen Thomas Museum to do this. And in thinking about how to go about it, um, I considered the possibility of choosing a theme and then looking for artists whose work fit the theme or giving the artist an opportunity to do work that fit a theme. And I decided it would be much more interesting for all of us, and for myself included, to look for works that I've really responded to, to artists whose work inspired me, and in particular, to look for different perspectives. Um, there's a lot in the news about issues involving people of color, and you know, I didn't want to say, okay, I'm going to look for this or that or the other. I think there are threads that tie all this work together. Some were surprised to me, and I think will be for the artists as well when they hear each other talk about, about their work. But, but the idea of having five different perspectives um, will give us a really interesting opportunity to look into the vision and aspirations of five important black artists in the So um, let's get started and hear from them. One of, one of the themes that I saw, not beforehand, but after talking with each artist and spending time with them and hearing about their work, um, to one degree or another, and, and this is probably true of all visual artists, they're all storytellers. It's just like, it's not literature, it's visual. And, and you have the opportunity to see into the work on many different levels. A lot of it is symbolism, some of it's very literal. But I think to one degree or another, all of these artists are storytellers. And there's a, a theme of story that arises within each, each artist's work. Um, I think the first artist I chose when I started to pull this together was Shane Bradford James. Um, I just seen the work that was new to me, and I've seen the work in a couple of gallery shows, and um, it was really t 
taken your book from the very beginning. Um, so I want you to tell us a little bit about you know, what what is the thing that most drives and inspires the vision you're, you're bringing us through the book. And so I would create these kind of 
as she put it, hybrid entities that transcended space, transcended time, transcended culture. And then with that, I could play with it. And then being a child of the uh, formation of the hip hop era, which is really an extension of quilt making and stitching together and piecing together, which is an extension of old mythologies again. It was always, I was always interested in remixing. Mixing one culture with another, mixing one sound with another, mixing one faith with another, and to see what that mix would basically speak to when it spoke to the public. And just kind of collapsing all boundaries between them and creating my own personal mythology out of that. And so a lot of the works become my own personal altars to this kind of pantheist worldview. And I always try to seek that. Gosh, you know, that, that ties so closely into what Patricia was saying about Stephen Thomas's work and you know his global perspective and the, the common unity of man beneath all these different isms and you know whatnot, the, the, the ways in which we're all united. Yeah, I think, I mean, as an artist, I think we are always looking for what stimulates us. Mm -hmm. And that transcends culture. We're not basically tying into, there might be a base culture that we're jumping off from, mm -hmm. which I definitely uh, pay homage to as an African American coming out of the South. But once I use that, I'm not using it as the point I'm going to, it's the point I'm jumping off from. Right. And right. then I can bring everything else in. So it's a solid foundation for me that I then pursue all these other uh, right. ideas from. Gotcha. You know, I'm, I'm just feeling so happy about the way things are moving just as, as our conversation has begun because you're sitting next to Lynn Marshall and Meyer and I in work that Lynn and I have done in the past, um, a lot of it was about celebrating our ancestors and, you know, and about the, the stories, many stories that you found about people here in Madison and the, the history of slavery here in Madison. And, um, you know, I see a lot of, of those threads in the work that, that we're showing here today. I'd love for you to say a little bit about your work and how those things are important to you. <coughs> Madison. <laughs> I, I think that for me, um, a lot of it has to do with um, with with uh, histories of places, and especially rural areas. I'm I'm drawn to rural areas because I was raised in a small town in North Carolina. So when we did the piece um, over at the cultural center. Um, it was about looking at the other side of Madison whose history is not so recognized. The dominant culture will, will generally tell the history. Mm -hmm. That's the camp of the philosopher will come to me in a minute. But that's the way that history is told. What I do is basically go into communities, examine you know, these histories, and then create my own narrative around what I've heard. I have to listen to people. And I have a background, I don't even know if it was, if I put it in my bio, but my, my background is, um, is not in, it, it's art, but it's art and also research. So my, my advanced degree, um, I'm a, a child of the South, I love the South. Did I just say that? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a girl raised in the South, I'm a true grit. Um, but I think that for me, in looking at the South, it's the contradictions uh, that are so subtle. That's, I think that that's one of the things that makes the South the South. Um, and so what I do is I go in and I'll, I'll interview people. My background, you don't get any sub more Southern than the University of Mississippi. So <laughs> you know, my advanced degree is in Southern studies from, uh, you know, from Ole Miss. And so what I'll do is I'll go into a community and I'll listen to people, I'll listen to their stories, and then I come back and create the artwork based on what I've heard. Yeah. So when you talk about storytelling, yeah. uh, it is a core component of, of what I do to take, you know, what is a story and then to mythologize it, going back to what you said, um, and then to add all the symbols and all the things that have to do with African American culture and so on and so forth. I just don't, I don't only just do it for, you know, for towns, but usually um, it, it, 
most of the time when I'm approaching something, especially if it has to do with the community or going into the community, I'm going to figure out there's some narrative that's going to be there that I get to retell and I get to connect with some place, you know, either with some place else or something else that has to do with that community. And I think that's the richness of, uh, of the African American community, especially, is because we have all these amazing stories that are there, but you never get to hear them, you know, because a lot of times the dominant culture just, you know, their story supersedes these right. other stories and you miss it. And I was just here yesterday for a funeral, um, Sandra Hall Cummins, her farm is right down on Bethany Road um, and that land, and that story is one of the most amazing stories that I've, you know, that I've heard in a while, where land has been passed down through women. It's a matrilineal passing down of land, uh, you know, and, and it's just absolutely amazing. The land's been in the family for 100 years. And that's right here in Madison. A lot of people don't know Penny Andrews, right here in Madison. Right, right, you know, right, right. His, his grandmother, Jesse Rosely, Wildcat, Tennessee, it doesn't get any better. <laughs> <laughs> right here in Madison, the ore plantation, which is, I can't remember the name of it now, right down the street, right yeah, here in exactly. Madison, tied to Plainview. So I was telling some people up in Roswell, you know, you start to dig around in these histories, and all of these connections are made, and all these stories. <laughs> Are there to be told and to and to retold. You can retell. You can reconfigure. Them. So, so so how did you decide? Because I, I see so frequently in your work, it's you use textiles and quilting and and what's the tie-in for you between the storytelling and the quilting? I grew up in the South, a black community. <laughs> Everybody is an actor. <laughs> Stories. I mean, and they didn't just sit down and tell a story. I mean, it was it was people performing stories. You know, you couldn't get a story from you know they got going. You know, he did this, this, and this. You know, and, and yeah. you, you get all these beautiful gestures. Uh, you know, as these stories are told, and that was always fascinating to me to sit around when I was allowed as a child. You know, because you know when I was a kid, the stories got kind of you know they were adult <laughs> stories, and it was like, all right, that's it, out. You know. <laughs> trying to hear, you know, what was going on. But the textile part comes in for my dad, uh, who actually was a photographer and a, and a tailor. Uh, and I didn't find, yeah, my dad was a tailor. Uh, he, let me put it this way. My father went to A&T to take up tailoring as a trade, but he wound up as a disc jockey. <laughs> and a jazz, right, a jazz musician and a, and a disc jockey. Uh, but, okay, so I tell stories. So when I was a little girl, because my dad would get all these fabric samples in these big books, um, and we lived in, I'm from Southern Pines, North Carolina, small population, resort town. If you play golf, you know where Southern Pines is. So my dad would get all these sample books. My mom would take them down to the country, which would have been Rayford, North Carolina, to an honor mine, and they would make these quilts out of them. And you put, now some of you will know this, you put the quilt on the bed. I don't know what they put between the top of the quilt and the, and the bottom fabric, but whatever was in between was heavy. <laughs> so when you got in the bed at night, you could barely turn over. <laughs> you know, because of these quilts. Well, that was sort of my introduction to quilting. And I think I was just fascinated, you know, by, by taking a book and stripping this fabric out of it and then putting it back together to make, right. you know, a coverlet. So that's kind of you know, kind of how I got into text. Yeah, yeah. So, so to me, that's a wonderful transition to Kevin Cole, because <laughs> a lot of those roots of his work came from textiles, too, from uh, stories your dad told you. And could you share with us on that, and well, how well, that's evolved for you? Well, I always say that my work is about five issues for, for, for the last 10 to 15 years. Number one, the story of my grandfather. Number two, Harry K. Katrina, and and um, September 11th, which are two events that changed our life forever, and the relationship between sight, sound, and color. So I listen to music, and also the uh, my relationship with people who I meet, such as a lot of my professors. So when I talk about a story that my grandfather told me, I was I was I was I just turned 18 years old, and my grandfather lived in Terre Haute, and so he was he was 91 years old. I told him I, I didn't want to go rest the boat because I didn't think it was going to make a difference.
difference. He kneeled down there and drew me a map uh, and told me to go stand beside these trees in this property. And when I told him I had to scare him, he told me I have to work at the lynch by the necktie when they went to vote. So the, they had been lynched by their neckties when they went to vote. And, and there are several documentations in Star City, Arkansas, of lynchings that had, that had happened close to his land. So that's why I use neckties in my work. So the on the tree, they're on his land. Yeah, on his land. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So, so the, the, the neckties is there. But then when I talk about Hurricane, when I talk about September 11th, I was supposed to be in New York with Eric Mack that morning. I decided I wouldn't go. And Eric, it took him a couple of weeks to get, to get back, and he sent me a picture of a little boy um, holding a piece of aluminum and tar paper. So I started working on aluminum and tar paper as my protest against September 11th. Then I, and then Hurricane Katrina happened, and I had a lot of crap levels. And I started to do a, a lot of process of mapping, mm -hmm. where I would map the path of the storm with these abstract shapes, the neckties, the script card shapes weaving in and out. In, 19, in 1995, I started working on um, a, a series. I was in the morning uh, um, hour. And there were a group of 11 year olds I was teaching. After the name, one major African American female had made major countries to America. One of the they name was Open Winter. <laughs> so I had to do, do research on Catherine Dunn, Billy Holiday, um, uh, Rosa Parks, and we made these scrolls inside these time capsules of their research paper. The series is called for the sisters who carry the burden of other sisters. Mm -hmm. So I started incorporating these scarf shapes as a, as a way of incorporating women into the pieces. And when I talk about music, I listen to music as I work jazz, hip hop, gospel, um, R&B, which is all music prevalent in the African American community. Mm -hmm. Well, my grandmother owned a blues club, and she gave B.B. King his first start. Oh, my gosh. Matter of fact, uh, if you listen to, if you, uh, he talks about in one of his albums, how he named his guitar, Lu Lu Lucia. Well, that was a fire in my grandmother's club. And the, the, and the, the lady that caused the fire, uh, her name was Lucia. <laughs> <laughs> so this was all at my grandmother's club. But the thing about it is people look at the negative part of the, the neckties, but the work is about celebration, how we move beyond that. Yeah. So each right. medium is very important to me, because when you think about uh, being lynched, I use wood. I'm one of the few artists that is bending wood. And, and if you ask about it, it's ancient black man's secret, anyway. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm bending wood, so the medium for the incident is very important to me, mm -hmm. how, how I use right. the, 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 right. the wood. So, uh, so I started working on, on aluminum, and so, it, so events that happen in my life I always carry these thoughts and follow me into, into my studio. So the, the large piece on the end is hip hop altarpiece. Right. And so how did you conceive of that as an altar? And well, um, I taught at Christ City High School. Mm -hmm. uh, Outcast came from Came from, from, from Tri Cities, um, Candy Burris from the House of Atlanta. And um, um, Stephen Wonder did an album called Conversation Peace, P E A C E, mm -hmm. when he was talking about the whole I idea of Dr. King's ho of the holiday. Mm -hmm. Where if you look at the ties, you only see the end of the ties, right. which is like a pickish fence. Oh, right. okay. So you got this southern idea, and then the whole idea, as I listen to music, I don't try to paint the music. I paint how the music makes me feel. Right, right. right. Okay. So at that time, I'm looking at the whole idea of uh, how did we, they were, there were incidents that were happening because they didn't want to give Dr. King a holiday. So P E A C E. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, great. <laughs> Alfred, so, um, gosh, I mean, I. I from the minute I saw your work, I was just knocked over. It's um, so strong and so textured, and it's very interesting to me. You kind of get right away the impact of environment on the figure. And um, can you say something about that? And if that's a thing in your work, can you sort of tell us about how that figures into the figure? Um, well, I guess I can start with it. In that regard, when it comes to the look, um, uh, the previous couple of series I've, I've done um, are more predominantly uh, with 
Kenton series. It's a, a series of sculptures that I did. Um, where I thought like we're with some quote unquote non-traditional art material. Right. Um, to uh, make the work look more stressed. Um, prone to the elements. So I, was, I started working with uh, uh, steel dust, uh, copper, uh, brass, bronze, and uh, acids. <laughs> and um, I learned a lot in regard to, to uh, what patina is. And you know, I started doing, you know, going out and, and looking at buildings. Studying how things uh, deteriorate when left outside, left into the elements. And that kind of that carried over into this series um, that I'm working on now. Uh, two fronts. Um, a little bit of background on the series is, uh, you know, the reason I'm doing the work is because, you know, one, I want to show where black folks are in the here and now, um, just as they are. But also, too, at the same time, uh, I wanted to show the stressors that uh, our people deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, 24 mm -hmm. hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. So visually, what I'm doing is, is um, you know, when you, when you leave uh, something outside, mm -hmm. you know, a piece of metal, some wood, or some stone, you know, stone erodes. Wood bends and twists and splits open and exposes the moisture and temperature changes. Um, metal uh, rusts or patinas. Um, people do the same thing when they're left to the elements without uh, uh, being left to a state of disrepair. Right. Maybe not physically, but in how we interact with one another, how we vote, um, how we spend our money. How we, how we raise our children, uh, and to a, the exposure is is being living in this country, um, and uh, being exposed to systemic pressures on a daily basis. So, when you see a piece like uh, uh, King Yang, mm -hmm. you know he's a relatively young man, but he's been born into stress. Now he is a real person. He's, yes. And and the figures you've painted mm -hmm. are people you know. That are yes. Uh, every every figure in this series is my met personally, mm -hmm. spoken to, uh, got to hear, you know, a, a little bit about them, you know, and usually often when I when I talk to them, they give me something that's very poignant mm -hmm. about what this series is about, you know, when it comes mm -hmm. to their, their working conditions, where they go to school, where they live, mm -hmm. all that factors into the economic, educational, social, psychological issues. Mm -hmm that black people deal with on a day to day basis. You know, not just here, but across the diaspora. Right. So, yeah. Right. So, I, I noticed that the pieces, all your work, or, or at least the paintings, are large scale, but the, and the pieces that involve landscape yeah. are larger. Do you, is that, why, do you have a reason for that? Is it important to you? Or? Um, in regard to scale, um, I think it's the the when it, the scale that uh, of that portion is what I'm going to focus with in the landscape are how those figures stand in that landscape. Mm -hmm. um, they tower over the landscape, mm -hmm. and um, what I'm trying to speak to is is that we're exposed, mm -hmm. and everybody can see that. Right. You know, so no matter where you are. In this neighborhood, you know, it, it's, it's scaring you right in the face. It's the pink elephant in the room. But the thing is, the conversation I'm trying to start is like, is somebody doing something about it? Right. Or is it simply the, the acceptance right. of a condition? Right. See what I'm saying? Yeah. Regardless of your, you know, wherever you stand, mm -hmm. racially, culturally, mm -hmm. you know, that, but that's a predominant problem that, that exists day in, day out. Right. The sun of the sun out there. It's casting shadows. It's, uh, you know, uh, and you see it continue to deteriorate. Right, and you, you see, at least when I look at that work, I think, you know, the, the rust of the materials and the textures and the bodies of the people, you know, 
represent the stresses <coughs> and challenges that they have living in the environments and with all the circumstances that you've talked about, mm -hmm. and how that affects their abilities to have agency in yes. the world. Yes. And the two sides of that is, is like, again, uh, you know, is, is, is there something that I could change or we can change? Right. Or is that just uh, the way it is? You know, um, a, a standpoint of benign neglect versus taking action. You know. So um, how, how do you see or, or do you see people in your community respond to the work in a way that's like, I want to do something about that? Or do, do they look at it and say, yeah, that's how it is? Or do you, do you get feedback that for both, yeah, for both sides of it. Um, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's a uh, enlightening. It's exciting at the same time too, depending upon those reactions. Because mm -hmm. you know, uh, hearing somebody or you know see react to it, it's like yeah, that's how it is, and uh, what, what kind of hurts me sometimes. But this is reality situation. Is it seems like who's younger mm -hmm. respond to it, mm -hmm. and you know, and, and, and give me a sense that yeah, that's, that's kind of true. You know, that's. That's what it is, and that you know, a, a, a young kid shouldn't have to right. to say that, you know. Right. But um, that's where we are, and that's what the series is about. It's right. A, it's a survey of, the, of of what's happening in the lab. That's right. 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 Um, it's very, very powerful, and it's continuing. So, right. so um, I think it'd be really interesting for us to have an opportunity for you audience to ask questions and to, you know, have a dialogue with the artist to the extent that you can. Um, so do we have any questions or any particular direction you'd like to hear the artist address? Okay. <laughs> inside, the pain is poisoned, but when artists, especially black artists, let it out, it's genius. Now, hearing what you just said, you know, I mean, I, I imagine you could comment to that from the standpoint of, you know, whether this applies to you on a personal level or not, or anybody else, but I'm just how, how does, I can read it again, how, how, how does that, how does that, sorry. Kept inside, the pain is poison, but when the artists, plural, especially black artists, let it out, it's genius. Well, I mean, I, well, I think when you look at it today, some of the highest paid African American artists are blacks with the MFA from Yale. And then right now, there's a group called Africa Cobra, which, which would like the Black Panthers of the art movement. They're just not getting their, their due. Africa Cobra stands for African Communion of Bad Relevant Artists. And they're bad just what? bad <laughs> relevant artists. Oh, okay. <laughs> so right now, they're just now getting their due. When you look at the, the, the auction market of African American art right now, the, the prices are, are, are up there because a lot of museums are behind in collecting art. For example, um, there was a guy by the name of Jack Whitten was doing he, he was doing abstraction a long time ago. He passed a few weeks ago, and his his prices are up there now. And that was a show called something to look forward to. Was at a Franklin Marshall College of African American artists who were in the '80s just now getting that too. And and most of them was abstract black artists. 
than just not getting their due. And when you look at it right now, you, you look at some of the MacArthur fellows, they are I mean, they they are now looking at African American artists because it was, you know, I think we're saying something that nobody hardly looked at in the past. And now all of a sudden it's, it's relevant, you know. And, uh, but when you look at, I, I wouldn't say so much to Jamie, but I like that. <laughs> uh, but I just think that now people are listening to what we have to say. Well, when I read it, to me, you know, I'm kind of backing up with what Alfred just got through talking about. I mean, uh, and when I was listening to you, I was hearing an aspect of what, to use this reference, pain in the, in the formation of your artwork, uh, expressing things that need work in the, in the sense of human relations. And um, the aspect of genius, well, uh, you know, to me, what was being said, there is a catharsis for the artist who takes that pain, creates something, and then steps back and says, you know, if you will, this is it. Um, uh, is that something that is, you know, a common experience or? I'll jump in. Um, what I think the part of that quote that I'll say problematic for me is when they say especially the black artists. In the sense that, well, when Picasso did Guernica, mm -hmm. he was feeling a lot of pain about what was going on with that civil war in Spain and he wanted to express it as an art. So I think it's universal to artists to express their anger, their pain, or whatever their emotions are. And it comes through if the artist is genius, regardless of the pain, um, you gotta have the talent to express it in a genius manner. Mm -hmm. So that's one thing. But then piggybacking off of what, what Kevin said, like I said, we're playing catch up when it comes to art. And there are various reasons why certain artists are elevated in the African American community and certain artists aren't. Uh, it's a lot of politics in the art world, especially the economics of the art world. And that's across the board, but especially with African American art. Um, there were geniuses coming out of the abstract expressionist movement that were pioneers in art. Betty Blayton Taylor was another one, one of the first artists to use yeah. shit canvases in her work. But she was an African American female, and so she didn't get the attention she deserved at the time when she was making innovative genius art. And only in her later years were people coming back around to our artists like uh, Kevin said. So a lot of the pain and frustration in the African American art community came about where we had elders who paved the way for many to be sitting here. Many of them ended up having to teach at universities, not because they didn't want to teach, but because the art market wasn't there to support them being sustained as artists. And many of them basically ended up teaching us not only the uh, how to be fine artists, but to navigate the politics of the art world, and they laid the foundation for the success that many of us are having now. So you have all these factors playing into the moment we're at now. Um, I was a curator and facilities manager at the Hammond's House Museum in Atlanta for many years, and I'll never forget when an appraiser came in to appraise the Hammond's House collection, and they appraised the Romare Beardens that were there. And they basically underappraised one work by possibly seventy-five to a hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. wow. So they said it had a certain level of value. Now Beard is one of the geniuses of American art, regardless of race. When the National Museum of Art decided to put a traveling exhibition together of Beard work, they had to come and appraise the collection. And they looked at the appraisal that was given before with this gentleman who did not have a background in understanding or knowing African American art said, oh, well, this work is worth 75,000. And she said, no, it's worth 175 to 180,000 on the low end. And you're suddenly looking at the dichotomies of what's going on. So the frustration and the pain that she quotes, I think a lot of it comes from just recognizing good art for what it is across the board, taking away the filters, taking away the racism, taking away the...